About 20 years ago, when I first started to travel, uh, whenever I would connect through, say, Germany, uh, Frankfurt Airport, I remember seeing large crowds of very Islamically dressed young men uh, standing ostentatiously, uh, obviously, flipping through pornographic magazines in the magazine shops. Um, it I didn't really think much of it at the time. I sort of thought, well, of course, they can't get that back where they live. This is a bit of a novelty to them. They're fascinated by it. But the more I think about that sort of thing, the more that I realize that I think that external controls on people's conduct, especially their morals, aren't going to work. And the reason why I say that is you can control what somebody does. You can force them not to do things that you don't want them to do. But what's going on inside of their own mind and what will happen the second that you take the restraints off, that's something entirely different. Um, for example, if we're going to look at uh, the, the uh, case of the young Muslim fellows uh, reading Playboy or whatever it was, um, what I would say is, if you were uh, in control of your morals, you would look at those magazines and you would say, I'm indifferent. Um, I have enough self-control that I understand that that sort of thing isn't going to make me, um, isn't going to really make me happy to read these sorts of magazines. In fact, it's slightly degrading, whatever. And you sort of say, I don't want to have anything to do with that. Um, whereas, if the only restraint on your conduct is external, i.e., somebody is forcing you not to have access to these things, or severely punishing you if you do have them, you're not really a good person at all. You're just someone, you're like a criminal who's been put in prison. Um, you're, you've been restrained, but they have in no way turned you into a good person. Goodness, morality, comes from within. Just by tying a murderer's hands and preventing him from killing someone doesn't mean that he's not a murderer, or at least a potential murderer, because the second that you remove those handcuffs, he'll go out and murder somebody again. If you can actually get through to that guy and explain to him and get, it, get him to work it out in his own mind why all this sort of thing is wrong, um, or if he can actually come to that conclusion himself, then you have made a moral person. Forcing somebody to do the right thing is impossible. You can force people not to do the wrong thing, but you cannot force someone to do the right thing. Because doing the right thing implies intent. It implies an actual conscious choice to be moral. And this is why I completely disagree with Sharia law. I think that any sort of strict law that is going to govern people's morality is guaranteed to fail. In fact, I believe that laws of that nature have the opposite effect. They do not make people moral. In fact, they are more likely to make people immoral because the only restraints on people's conduct are external. It's not a case of me controlling myself inwardly and saying, I have the opportunity to do all of these things. I have the opportunity to cheat on my wife. I have the opportunity to get drunk. I have the opportunity to go see strippers. I have the opportunity to do all kinds of things which we would consider immoral, but I opt consciously not to do them because I believe that they are the wrong thing to do. I believe that they are immoral. People that get used to having all of their behavior uh, controlled from outside, all their moral choices removed from their own hands because of the fact that their, their environment is so heavily controlled, never have to reach a fork in the road like that. Do the right thing, do the wrong thing. My own choice here, not somebody else forcing me. And this get, brings me to the uh, Islamic concept of jihad and my understanding of it. It seems to me to be something that's widely misunderstood in the West. It seems to people seem to think that it's a, um, a, uh, a holy war where you go out and you blow up the infidels or whatever. And I'm not going to say that there aren't Muslims who don't think that. I'm qu quite certain that a lot of Muslims do believe that that is what jihad is, uh, and it might be in a certain case or in a certain way of looking at it. But I've always thought, or the way it was always explained to me by the Muslims that hold most of my respect. Um, is that jihad is going on in here. You struggle with yourself. You struggle with your own temptations, with your own evil nature, with your own nature to sort of that, that wants you to do the wrong thing even though you know that it's probably not going to make you happy anyway. Um, 
like a person who is attempting to become physically fit, you're tempted to sit on the couch all day and drink beer and eat uh, fatty foods, but you know that this isn't good for you, so you consciously choose not to do this. It's not that someone has taken this, the, the, the possibility of doing this out of your hands. You have conducted an inner jihad, a real jihad, uh, again, as it is explained to me. I'm not going to tell Muslims uh, tenets of their own faith, but that's the way it was always explained to me. The real inner jihad means you overcome th that part of your nature which is weak, which is capable of making the wrong moral choices. It's funny that these two strains of thought inside of uh, Islam are, in many ways, antithetical to each other. And I tend to think that, as a Westerner, only the individual can make the individual's moral choices. You cannot force somebody to be good. You cannot force somebody to be moral. Thank you.